All right, and we have so many wonderful supporters tonight, too, and I want to make sure that I mention each of them. My name is Denise Lucy. I'm a professor and executive director of the Institute for Leadership Studies here at Dominican, and it's just my honor and privilege to welcome you to our campus. What do you think of the campus? Is it beautiful? It is beautiful. It is beautiful, especially on a sunny day. Our leadership lecture series is a partnership with Book Passage. And Book Passage is a jewel of our community. It's been here for, yes, let's hear it for Book Passage. It's, we've had the privilege of Book Passage here in, in Marin and San Francisco for 45, maybe six years. And it's just a tremendous, tremendous partnership that Elaine and Bill Petricelli have provided to Dominican. This is our 17th year. This is our 140th lecture of the most amazing people in America have come to this, this hall and welcomed our students and our campus and you. So we're so happy that you're here. This is a special partnership too, because tonight was the brainchild of Bonnie Morse. Where are you, Bonnie? There you are, Bonnie, and Gary Morse. The firm is called Bonnie Bee and Company. Bonnie is the bees and Gary is the and company. Right, Bonnie? And also they have founded a nonprofit called Be Audacious that helps to bring us together to better understand honeybees and biodiversity and their wonderful teachers and their community oriented. And because of their spirit, they brought together several sponsors tonight. And I'd like to mention them. So give it up for Bonnie and Gary Morris. <laughs> Marine Conservation League. Who knows about, yes, let's do it. I learned that Marine Conservation League is 88 years old. Yes, founded by four women in Marin who decided that the Golden Gate Bridge was gonna bring development to, the, to this area and decided we needed to conserve our land, and they did do that for us, 40, 88 years ago. Yes. So they've helped to acquire and preserve some of Moran's defining public lands, including Mount Tamapai State Park and Point Reyes National Park because of MCL. Their work continues as our community faces unprecedented threats from wildfire, drought, and loss of biodiversity. Thank you, Marin Conservation League, for your support tonight. <laughs> Equally as important, California Native Plant Society since 1965. Yes, let's thank them. They have worked to protect the state's native plant heritage and preserve it for future generations. The mission is to conserve California native plants and their natural habitats and increase understanding, appreciation, and horticultural use of native plants. Thank you so very much, California Native Plant Society. The Marin Municipal Water District supports the efforts to increase the usage of native plants in all of our gardens. It's interesting that their business model is to encourage their customers to use less of their product. <laughs> I think that's interesting. <laughs> they have projects like Cash for Grass, and we want to thank Marin Municipal Water District for really looking out for all of us and for being our supporter tonight. Thank you. <laughs> our Water, Our World is an award-winning partnership between city and county-based water pollution prevention agencies also with garden centers and hardware stores selling pest control products. Their focus is on less toxic, eco-friendly products and techniques. Thank you so much, Our Water, Our World, for helping on that project. <laughs> and also, as I mentioned earlier, Bonnie and Gary Morris, Morris uh, of Be Audacious created a project called 10 plus 10 plus 10. It means that we can each do something. 10 foot by 10 foot, we can plant diverse plantings, couldn't we? And then give us 10 bucks so we can promote that goal. So please give $10 to 10 plus 10 plus 10 at Be Audacious. 
And we want to thank them for helping us to, post, uh, to produce tonight's event. Thank you, 10 plus 10 plus 10. So, with all of that support, we now can bring you our guest speaker, Dr. Doug Talamay. He is a long champion of the issues promoted by this set of sponsors tonight. This year, he launched a new website and an initiative called homegrownnationalpark.org. It challenges all of us to transform our home gardens from high input, low output green deserts into havens for wildlife through the use of natural plants. We also want to, to turn on our biodiversity, we, excuse me, we want to help turn on our biodiversity and deal with this crisis. We want to make sure that our garden has low input, output oasis for the life that helps support us. I thought it would be important to note that the 27th of October has been named. Katie Rice, one of our supervisors in the County of Marin, made a motion and the Board of Supervisors accepted the proclamation that today, October 27th, is Bio, Marin Biodiversity Day in Marin County. Thank you so very much, County of Marin, for welcoming Dr. Talame and this important issue. So now let's get to meet him. He will discuss his book, The Nature of Oaks, The Rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Native Trees. He is an entomologist, ecologist, and, conser and conservationist. He has written and co-authored several books and many journal articles. He is professor and chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. It is my privilege to welcome Dr. Douglas Talamay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> what a great introduction. We're in Biodiversity Day, what a good idea. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight uh, and talk to you about the nature of oaks. I'm really talking about the life that is associated with oaks. Now, remember, I'm from Pennsylvania, so my examples are mostly from Pennsylvania. I use California examples when I, when I got the chance. But most of what's happening in Pennsylvania is happening here as well. So the idea is to give you an idea of what you might see on your, your oaks. So my story starts in July 2000. That's when my wife and I moved in to our, our new home in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It was part of a farm that was broken up. Uh, had been farmed for uh, almost 300 years. And the last thing they did was mow it for hay. So there were very, very few plants there, very, almost no biodiversity at all. And our, our goal was to restore the life on, on this uh, little plot of land. Uh, well, in order to do that, I need to put plants back. Uh, we, we moved in in July, but in uh, September, there was a pair of oak trees down the road about a mile and a half that we had a little running route. We used to pass them, and they started dropping acorns. They're white oaks. So we got some of those acorns and, and planted them as, as uh, step one in, in regenerating the biodiversity at home. So the white oak group germinates in the fall, and that's what they look like. They put out a, a radical. It's a little root goes straight down. Uh, they don't put up any, any green mass until the following spring. Uh, and, and that's what that looks like in the following spring. A couple of leaves, and then they just sit there. And this is one of the reasons that people, uh, they've associated slow growth with oaks, particularly in the white oak group. They say, well, they're just sitting there and they're not doing much. They actually are doing a lot. They're building a huge root system. In their first year, oaks grow 10 times more root biomass than, than leaf biomass. And it's a really important part of their life history because uh, those roots are going to, to um, carry them through a very long life if they're allowed to build them. And we'll talk more about that later. So that's what our, our house looked like uh, after the first year of that oak growing. Um, I've got a little deer cage around it because where we come from, there's a lot of deer and they love those, those oaks. Uh, so we're going to follow that, that oak. 18 years later, that's what it looked like. It's 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, canopy spread of 30 feet. Still a baby, but it's a real landscape tree. Now, oaks are, are uh, the lifeline for an awful lot of, of species. There are dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks. Lots of, of mammals, rodents and, and bears and raccoons. Um, a few, a few reptiles, not too many reptiles, fence lizards and a few things like that. Hundreds of species of moths, though, 
are associated with oaks, and then the, the parasitoids and predators that depend on those, those moths. We've got centipede gall wasps, we've got a lot of beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic woodworm beetles, weevils, um, spiders. I don't talk a lot about spiders because I found that people don't like them very much. But. <laughs> and then dozens more species of, of arthropods, mollusks, and annelids that are associated with the oak leaf litter underneath the tree. The problem is that this diverse web of life that's associated with oaks almost everywhere, it goes unnoticed, unnoticed and unappreciated by people who have oaks in their landscapes. And that's a shame. That's why I wrote this book, The Nature of Oaks. It is a month-by-month -month guide to the things that could be happening on the oaks near you. So before we start, let's talk about a few facts. Um, the genus Quercus, that's the oaks, contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. Uh, it comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. So oaks are fine trees, and they are indeed. There are four main taxonomic sections in the genus that are common in North America. The white oak group, Quercus. The red oak group, Lobate. The live oak group, Varentes. And a much smaller protobalanus group, the canyon oak group. And you have that out here in the west. This is the distribution of oaks. Uh, in this country. Uh, there are one or more species in every place except the brown areas. So the, the uh, high mountainous or very dry areas don't have any oaks. But uh, you can see California has a number of species. The center of distribution uh, in, in uh, North America is the southeast, um, where we have uh, many of those species. But oaks are, are distributed through most of the country. They have a much longer life cycle than people think. Average 900 year life cycle. 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. During each one of those periods, they're delivering unique ecological services to the landscape around them. Everybody wants to know what the oldest oak tree is in the country. Uh, in terms of a, a traditional tree that we think of, it's probably the Middleton oak. It's a southern live oak. It's, it's estimated to be 1,500 years old in Charleston, South Carolina. But I don't know if you've heard of the Palmer oak. You guys have a species uh, of oak out here in California. The Palmer oak uh, will um, clone itself. And, and uh, this particular specimen is estimated to be 13,000 years old. So that, uh, that beats even some of many of the redwoods, right? So, so oaks can live a long time and they can get huge. This was the Y oak in Y, Maryland. It was the biggest white oak in the country. Uh, it's gone at this point, fell over in a hurricane, but I saw it shortly before it, it fell over, and it's a big tree. Oaks do get big. And again, that's another thing that people think, that all oaks are gigantic. Not true. We'll talk about that. Other things we're going to talk about. Oaks have superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning there is more, more, there are more types of life associated with oaks than any other tree genus in, in uh, well, at least in the temperate zone. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide, pulling carbon dioxide out of the air and locking it up in their tissues, uh, and then pumping the extra carbon dioxide, or the extra carbon that they're, they're uh, fixing through photosynthesis through their roots into the, the soil. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots, particularly oaks, have deposited there over the, the eons, and those are good things these days. They're the best soil stabilizers. We'll talk about why. They make the best leaf litter, which means they're promoting the healthiest watersheds. Okay, I started this book in October, and people are always very interested. Why October? Because that's when my wife said, you should write a book about oaks. <laughs> and it was October. And I looked out the window, and that's what my oak looked like. We're going to follow the, the life on that particular tree. And October, of course, is, is uh, the month that uh, we're bombarded with acorns. When, when you get acorns, they're going to drop mostly in October. And a single oak can make up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. Acorns are large. They're large seeds. They're very nutritious, and they're supporting an awful lot of life forms. Uh, like rodents, we don't talk about that too much, but they really depend on it. The big guys do as well. Uh, black bears love acorns when they're around, and of course the squirrels that we see all the time, and the cute deer that are now a problem throughout the country because we've got too many of them. A number of birds depend on oaks, turkeys, for example. You've got turkeys here now because we introduced them, didn't we? Uh, red-bellied woodpeckers, titmice, 
towhees, believe it or not, uh, nuthatches, Lewis's woodpecker, flickers. Many ducks depend on oaks, particularly uh, wood ducks. They really love them. Any, any acorn that falls into the water, they die for them, but they come out on the land and they eat a ton of oaks as, as well, or acorns. Every time I misspeak, you have to clap or something so that I, <laughs> so that I stop doing it. Uh, there are a number of invertebrates that depend on, on acorns, uh, like the acorn weevil. This is an acorn weevil uh, larva tunneling out of an acorn. That's what the adult looks like. They can be very common in, in acorns. Uh, and, very, and similarly, there's uh, acorn moth. It's a, it's a species complex. They look so similarly, we can't tell which, which one is which, but they all develop in uh, acorns as well. So after the acorns fall beneath the tree, uh, a few, few, well, maybe a week and a half, two weeks later, that's what it looks like. It's total destruction. All those things that eat those acorns have eaten them or carried them away. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce when you see such carnage under, under the tree. And this is where jays come into the, into the story. Uh, it turns out that oaks and jays have a very ancient mutualism. They both evolved in Southeast Asia about 65 million years ago, uh, and they... Uh, started this mutualism right away. Jays get food in the form of those acorns from oaks, uh, but jays, the way they use those acorns, allow oaks to move farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. And this is how that works. Jays store acorns for, for winter food. Uh, so they don't cache them, so they're not taking a bunch of them and piling them together. Uh, they bury them individually, and that's important. So they will pick up an acorn, and then they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree, which is much farther than other acorn dispersers will, will actually move them. Then they bury that acorn beneath the ground. Now, if they think another jay has seen them do that, they'll wait around a little bit and then they'll dig it up and move it because they ha <laughs> jays know that jays steal acorns. <laughs> and then, of course, during the winter, uh, they're, they're, um, the ideas are going to go find those, those acorns. Now, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. But they only remember where one out of every four acorns is. <laughs> and that's the, that's the key. That means a single jay can plant 3,360 oak trees every single year. And if they're planting them a mile away from the tree, they have moved oaks a long way. Uh, now, I've got a blue jay pictured there because that's the jay in, in our yard, but uh, of course you have scrub jays out here. I think we've got seven or eight species of jays around the country, and in, other, other, in Eurasia, jays are doing the same thing. Uh, there's a scrub oak eyeing a, an acorn, and they, they're doing exactly the same thing. But uh, jays are not the only birds that have specialized uh, relationships with, with uh, acorns. You know about the acorn woodpecker. It's a beautiful bird that depends on acorns. They have a, a very interesting behavior. They live in family groups that um, de defend territories. And these territories are, are trees that they have drilled holes into so that they can store their, their acorns. Uh, and they stuff them in those holes. I'm not sure why they're doing that. And rather than burying them in the ground, they store them in, in the holes, I guess, and then they eat them when, when they get hungry. Uh, and they can store a lot of, of acorns. Up to 50,000 holes will be drilled in a single acorn tree. Uh, and they'll use that for years. So they eat them during the, the winter, and then the summer, the, the, they're empty, and then they fill them up again in the fall. Uh, and that's worth, worth defending. And there's an interesting, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for examples of natural selection working, uh, there's an interesting little tidbit about the beaks of, of uh, acorn woodpeckers. Pacific populations have bills that are 20% longer than uh, the, the uh, acorn woodpeckers in the interior. Why is that? Well, the coast live oak has really long acorns. So they have to drill holes that are, are deeper for them than many of the species of oaks in the, in the interior. Okay, November. This one, you, you might recognize that this was either a great year for acorns or a terrible year for acorns. There doesn't seem to be much in between. Uh, and when it's a great year for acorns, it looks like this, and we call that a mast year. So uh, it's an unusual behavior where trees are, are, are reproducing in really irregular ways. So of course, ecologists want to explain everything, uh, and, and that that's what we do. We come up with hypotheses. Why are, are, are the oaks masting? There are four primary, primary uh, hypotheses about what causes oak mass. And probably the most pro uh, popular one is 
predator satiation, following that is predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. Let's talk about each one of those. Predator satiation. So this is an acorn weevil larva. They can be really numerous in acorns. As a matter of fact, they can inhabit 90% of the acorns that are produced on a tree. Now if oaks produced acorns at a fairly regular state, acorn weevils and acorn moths and all the other things that eat acorns would stabilize their populations around that number and they'd eat all the acorns. There'd be very few left for, for oak reproduction. Uh, but if oaks produce a lot of acorns one year and the acorn population explodes and the squirrel population explodes and everybody, and they do, the, in the rodent poppies, they all go crazy when you have a mashed year. And then the next year, the oaks produce very few acorns or none. Those populations crash. That's reducing the, the acorn predator population. Uh, and you probably go two or three years with very few acorns. And then there's another mashed year. And at that point, the, the, the acorn eaters populations are very small, so there's so many acorns that overwhelms them and, and they can't eat them all. Improved pollination. Um, I'm not sure why, why you invited me here or why Bonnie invited me. She's a bee person, but oaks are wind pollinated. Uh, so it's, it's one of the things oaks don't do is, is help the pollinators. Actually, there's, there's a growing evidence that a number of native bees do use oak pollen. They just don't move it around and, and actually pollinate. But they're, they're wind pollinated, which means the more pollen you have floating around at the same time, the greater the chance uh, the pollen is going to go from the male flower to the female flower. And it's got to go from the male flower on one tree to the female flower on another tree because uh, a single tree doesn't produce male and female flowers at the same time. So that's a game of chance. And the more, again, if, if you have a mass year and all the oaks are, are, are releasing, the catkins are releasing a tremendous amount of pollen at the same time, there's a better chance that uh, pollination will be successful. And then finally, energy allocation. By the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can ever have good fall color, that's the scarlet oak. They can have good fall color. Well, energy allocation, there's never enough energy to go around. So oaks, oaks uh, divide it up. Some years they'll, they'll put the energy towards acorn production, other years they'll put it towards growth. They almost never have enough energy to put it towards both at the same time. So it's specializing in what they're going to do. Now none of those hypotheses are mutually exclusive. All of them could be happening at the same time. And uh, don't ask me when the next mast year is going to be because nobody's been successful in predicting that. Weather comes into it, whether there's, it's raining when the catkins are releasing their, their uh, pollen. So a lot of factors going into it, plus what we just talked about. Okay, December. Uh, so here's another peculiarity about oaks. You might notice, particularly in the white oak group again, that um, they don't drop their leaves in the fall particularly young plants, and particularly the lower branches, the, the juvenile leaves on, on young plants. They hang on the tree all winter long. Uh, that condition is called marcescence, and it's peculiar to uh, not just oaks, there's not many trees that, that do it, but oaks do it uh, more than, than others. And again, we gotta explain it. Why are they hanging on to their leaves? It's a deciduous tree, everybody else has dropped their leaves. Why, why are they hanging on? And the leading hypothesis here is that it wasn't all that long ago that there were huge Pleistocene mammals, many of which were browsers, meaning they were eating buds of woody plants uh, that roamed uh, North America and Eurasia. Uh, these are the group of large mammals that were in Mexico alone. Three species of mammoths, the, the uh, giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet, those were big guys. Uh, and they ate a lot of, of buds, but if you surround your, your buds with dead leaves, it's hard to get a, a mouthful of, of a, a nutritious bud without getting a mouthful of something that, that you don't really want. It also uh, makes a lot of noise when you forage on, on an oak branch like that. And there were a lot of predators around back in, in those days too. And it wasn't that long ago, you know, eight, 9,000 years ago that these things were, were still active in North America. Um, and the fact that, that you only have marcescence on lower branches supports this hypothesis. When you get about 18 feet up, there's no more marcescence. And that's as far as those, those uh, browsers could, could actually reach. So hard to say for sure, but that's the leading hypothesis. The uh, marcescent condition of oaks gives them a landscaping trait that most other deciduous trees don't have, and that is you can use them as screens even in the wintertime. You can certainly use them as screens in the summertime, but in the wintertime, they hang onto their leaves so you can block out your neighbor that you don't want to look at with your oaks. 
All right, January. Uh, where I come from, it's cold in January, uh, and, and you don't think there's a lot happening. Most people are not out looking up in the trees, but if you do look in a tree, this is a Quercus gariana, by the way, uh, the Oregon oak, uh, you might see birds up there, little birds, things like uh, golden crown kinglets or chickadees or titmice. Now, chickadees and titmice are eating seeds at our feeders all winter long, but only 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders. And the golden crown kinglet and ruby crown king, kinglet, they're insectivores. They don't eat any seeds at all. They're tiny little birds, uh, and they should have migrated, like all the other insectivores that go south where the insects are still common. But they, they don't. Uh, and they, they're bouncing around these trees as if they're finding something to eat. Well, I'm an entomologist, and we all know that there aren't any insects up in the, the dead branches all winter long. So that's a big puzzle. Well, Bern Heinweg is a great naturalist. He writes the column in Natural History uh, magazine every, every fall, every month. Um, he's always thinking outside the box, and he wondered why golden crown kinglets were bouncing around those trees in January in Maine, so he looked in their crops, and he found the crops were full of caterpillars in January in Maine, which means there's caterpillars up there, and there are caterpillars up there. If you, if you climb up in your oak, as I did to get a vine off in, in uh, November a few years ago, you come down and your shirt's covered with caterpillars. They're sitting on the branches looking like sticks, um, and they look a lot like sticks, so we don't even notice them. What are they doing there? Nothing. They're just sitting there. <laughs> And when it, gets, when it goes below freezing, which it does frequently, they're antifreeze proteins that keep their cells from, from bursting. Uh, and so they, they shrink a little bit in the cold, then they swell a little bit, but they're not eating anything. They're simply sitting there all winter long. Why are they doing that while the birds are eating them? Um, again, uh, nobody knows, but uh, the leading hypothesis is that these are, are, are late instar caterpillars, mostly in the family Geometridae, which means uh, they have a little bit more growing to do before they become adults. Uh, and if they're hanging around the trees uh, all winter long, they are there ready to eat the brand new leaves that pop out, and they can eat them faster than anything that overwinters as an egg or anything that overwinters as an adult and then has to lay eggs. So they get the first, first dibs on all that new foliage if they make it through the winter. February. This is definitely the quietest time of, of year for oaks. So it's a good time to look at oak landscaping myths. Now, you know, myths typically have some, some degree of facts associated with them, or they used to anyway. <laughs> so, I'm glad somebody got my little joke. <laughs> but these, I hear this all the time. I can't plant an oak because they're too expensive. They grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. They're too big to use on small plots. They're going to lift up your sidewalk. They're going to burn down your house when you have a, a fire. And one I took out because I didn't think you had a problem with it here is that they're going to fall down and crush your house. But I just heard they do that here too. Um, so let's look at each one. Is there, any, is there any basis to any of these myths? So oaks are too expensive. Well, they are if you insist on planting big oaks. If you want instant gratification, I've got to start with a big tree. Uh, and most people, when they landscape, that's, that's what they want. They, they want, they think their landscape is a postcard. They're going to put in the trees the way they, they want them to be eventually. They're never going to change. So they want to start large. And they're willing to pay a lot of money to do that. But there are problems that can be associated with that, and that is how those, those trees are actually grown. When you grow a big tree in a pot, it depends on how you do it. And I just learned this. Uh, I, I was under the impression that it is impossible to grow them in pots without them becoming seriously root-bound. Now, remember that great big root system we talked about? They'll go around and around and around the, the pot. And then when you transplant that, they continue to grow, but they strangle each other. And in a few years, the, the tree kills itself. Um, so you have to be very careful that if you get an oak grown in a pot, it is not root-bound. Now, there is new technology. Uh, called uh, air, air pots that allow air to seep in from the side, and it, it's pretty good at preventing um, the, the uh, root-bound condition of, of oaks. So uh, apparently you can get a bigger oak now if it's been properly grown without it being root-bound. It still will be very expensive, and I mean like 3,000 bucks. Um, the other alternative is to, is to buy them in uh, bald and burlap condition, uh, and 
You can see they're not very happy. In order to do that, those, those trees have to be seriously root pruned. So those giant roots they put out everywhere, they're chopped off and then they wrap it in, in burlap and then they bring it to your yard and plant it. If I plant an acorn the same day I plant one of these trees that I've just paid $3,000 for, uh, this tree is gonna sit there for a decade trying to rebuild its root system and it's not gonna grow at all. It's got a 50% chance of dying. My egg corn is gonna grow and, and, and surpass that tree in the same time period. It'll be much healthier and a much happier tree. And that's the tree that's gonna to get to be 900 years old. This poor guy with no roots isn't. This is the size you should plant your oaks. If you don't wanna plant an egg corn, get them as small as possible, which is hard to do because nurserymen don't wanna sell them small because they want to charge you $3,000. But if you really want a, a uh, healthy tree, you want to go as small as possible. But I know what you're going to say, they grow so slowly, I can't start, I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, is that true? There's my, there's my little oak uh, that we planted from an acorn. It's six years old there. And what I'm going to do is have a race between this white oak and Bella. Bella's two years old here. Uh, so she's getting ready to hit her, her growth spurt. Now the tree has a head start, it's true but everybody knows that people grow faster than, than oaks. So let's, let's have a race here. The oak is six years old there. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, Bella's losing. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and there's 20. 2020, Bella's got her mask on. She's through growing. She's taller than me. She's taller than me and you know how tall that is. But look, she has, clearly, she has clearly lost the race here. So this is a white oak, the slowest growing oak we have in the East, but obviously it's not, not so slow. Uh, they grow just fine once they, once they get going. And by the way, Bella's not my, my daughter. We just kind of borrowed her for this. <laughs> the, big, the point is you don't have to wait uh, for your oak to start to contribute ecologically to, to your, your local ecosystem. This is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves, and here's a, a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. Uh, so it's contributing to its, the local food web immediately, the same year you put in that, that acorn. Uh, and and that's, that's important, and we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, are oaks too large to use in small yards? Well, not here. Um, I'm sure, now this is, I drive by these, these trees, there's a whole, whole street row of them on the way to the University of Delaware. Uh, and these, these houses, those oaks were probably planted the same time they, they built those houses. So they're probably at least 100 years old. And during that 100 years, they have lowered the temperature of that house by 10 degrees. Remember, in the old days, there was no air conditioning. So this, this was important. They haven't fallen over and, and crushed the house, but you're not gonna find a landscape designer anywhere who will suggest you put a big oak in a tiny place like this. All I'm saying is, it happens. Um, but the important point is there are small oaks that we're not using. Here are the list of small oak species in the West that, that typically are not in the trade, but they could be in the trade. Uh, some of them are actually ground covers. So the, I can't find an oak that's, that's small enough for my yard uh, is, you can. Or, but we've got to help you. We've got to get these species into, um, into the, the, uh, the trade. In the east, we have fewer. The dwarf chestnut oak is pretty regularly in the trade. I've got one of those, Quercus prinoides. There, well, there's, there's uh, shrub live oak. I guess I took my prinoides out. It produces acorns at, at five feet tall. Um, so these are trees that can be used as street trees. Um, so, you know, the old question, oh, the oaks are too massive to, to get that valuable foliage into the, into the yard. Not necessarily true, we just have to do it. And this, this is what a typical shrub live oak, uh, Quercus, what, Turinella, would look like. They, they just don't get very big, so you can get them into your landscape. Will oaks lift up your hardscape? Um, they could, depending on which species you use and what the, the soil type that you plant them in. If you plant them over bedrock, the Roots have to go laterally, and they will lift up whatever they, they hit. But if you've got a decent amount of soil, uh, most oak roots are fairly deep. This is a pin oak, uh, and look, it hasn't disturbed the, the street, tree, uh, street there at all. These are two big red oaks at the University of Delaware. Giant tree right next to the curb hasn't, hasn't moved it at all. So if you're not over a bedrock or an agricultural pan, a pan is where the, the um, plows 
you know, for the last 100 years, plowed about 18 inches deep, and it created compact soil beneath that. The roots will run along the top of that pan, too, unless you break it up. But otherwise, uh, it is not a given that the oak is going to mess up your hardscape. Well, oaks burn your house down. Well, people worry about that. You know, you, there, of course, you've got fires out here and you've got to get all the vegetation away from your house. But there is research that suggests that particularly the live oaks uh, act as a barrier. Most of, of your, your crazy fires spread by flying embers and these live oaks intercept them and don't burst into flame. So it actually can form a, a barrier around your house as opposed to something that you absolutely have to, have to get rid of. These, these green leaves don't burn very easily is what I'm trying to say. Okay, March. Those marcescent leaves are finally starting to drop, which means they're going to start to do uh, a lot of important jobs on the ground. There's a tremendous amount of diversity in leaf shape uh, in the genus Quercus. This is just a little bit of it, but um, juvenile leaves are much bigger than adult leaves. You've got uh, leaves that look like willows, so we call them willow oaks. That's the emery oak right there. They look like uh, hollies. Um, but again, tremendous amount of, of uh, leaf variation. And oaks make a lot of leaves. A big oak will make 700,000 leaves a year. And if you line them up on tennis courts, that'll cover four tennis courts. Uh, and that's the job. It's to cover the ground. It's to provide a protective blanket on the forest floor that me maintains moisture. And of course, in dry conditions like, like uh, what you have most of the year, that's really important. Because all the creatures that live in the soil depend on high humidity and, and moisture as long as, as possible. Uh, so, the first thing people worry about is that their plants won't be able to get through leaf litter, because, and that's why we have to rake it all away and throw it away. That's, that's just not true. Um, this is a natural uh, layer of, of white oak leaves, and that's a natural, it's not a planting, the, the, er, the, the ferns came up themselves, they, they burst right through it. I'm doing a little experiment at home with flocks that are coming right through my, my uh, leaf litter. Now, if you pile up five feet of it, yes, it will smother the, the plants, but they can get through there. But in the meantime, they are again maintaining the conditions that harbor a tremendously diverse community of animal life beneath the soil. Uh, there are more species that live under the, under the ground in the, in the soil than above the soil. Now most of them are tiny, but in a single square meter of, of uh, soil underneath an oak with a good oak leaf, or leaf litter, there can be 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails, those are columbulins, that's a little smithurid columbulin, but there's several families of them, 90,000 proturins, which are tiny little primitive insects, you need a microscope to see them, 1 million nematodes, a lot of things happening under there, but none of them will be there if the soil dries out and you lose your, your, your leaf litter. There are actually things that eat leaf litter, like the banded hair streak, uh, they will, the caterpillars eat the dead, dead leaves. So that's a pretty butterfly, and, and there are, you have several lysenids out here that uh, depend on your oaks. But there are 70 species of what we call litter moths, moths that uh, develop, again, on de dead leaf litter. This is the ambiguous litter moth, the dark-spotted palthus, uh, and, and 68 others. And then you have all the predators that, that eat all of those things. Now we've got, we've got a lot of spiders involved here and centipedes and millipedes. Um, most of what's living in the oak leaf litter is our detritivores. They're breaking it down and returning the nutrients to the soil so that the oak tree can take them up the next year. Now oak leaf litter lasts about three years or a single leaf takes about three years to break down. That's why I say it's the best leaf litter because it, it will cover the soil all year long. Uh, back east, when we have maples and we have, we have uh, birches and, and uh, tulip trees, those things don't make it through a single season before breaking down, which means uh, the, the soil is exposed. Then you get a rainstorm, it erodes away, you lose the moisture, the sun bakes it. Uh, so the oak leaf is protecting this very valuable community, as well as all the mycorrhizal fungal co community that are breaking down the leaf litter and returning the, the soil, the nutrients to the soil. In other words, you've got a circular economy on, in your yard if you keep the leaf litter there. When you rake it up and throw it away, uh, then you either fertilize your tree and you won't ever do it the way the tree wants to be fertilized, uh, or you don't fertilize it and eventually it just runs out of nutrients and that's why it doesn't live 900 years. So we used to think about, well, we're now thinking about uh, 
moisture. We want all of the rain that falls on our property to stay on our property. And if you landscape in a way that it runs off, you've got to change something. You build rain gardens. You want to keep it there so it can infiltrate. Same thing with leaf litter. You want all the leaf litter that falls on your property to stay in your property so that all that nutrient can be recycled and you can have a healthy soil ecosystem. April is when bud break finally starts to happen. Um, and it's the chance for you to see one of the most ephemeral interactions in, in all of nature. Uh, only happens uh, once a year and it takes about five minutes. So if you're lucky, you can see it, but otherwise you've, you've missed it for a year. And I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in oak buds. Um, so that's a female cynipid gall wasp. She's going to create a gall, and we'll talk about what that is in a second. That's her, that's her ovipositor right there, and she's inserting an egg into the meristematic cells of this oak bud. That is a male gall wasp who has already mated with her. He's riding her so that when she finishes ovipositing, he will mate with her again. He wants to make sure that he fathers every single egg that she puts out. This is a hopeful male that hopes he goes away. <laughs> and maybe he'll try to knock him off, I don't know, but typically he's, he's a loser. So, so what she's doing is injecting an egg into the oak bud, but she's also injecting plant hormones which manipulate the growth of those cells. The cells in a, in a meristematic bed like this are like stem cells. They can turn into lots of different things. So what they turn into is a compromise between what the oak wants them to turn into and what the, the cynipid gall wasp wants them to turn into. I often hear about galls, uh, the, people call them cancerous growths on a tree. That's not a good analogy because cancerous growths are uncontrolled growth, they're just growing and growing. Galls are extremely controlled growth, gall, uh, growth, and every single gall or species, every single cynipid species makes a species-specific gall shape. So you can identify the species of, of galler just by looking at the type of gall. Uh, there are a lot of gallers out there, about 5,000 species of cynipid galls uh, on oaks, which is most of the, the species of, of cynipids in the world. A single tree can support 70 different species of, of gallers. Now, most galls are hollow, which is, which is curious. When you break them open, there's a bunch of air in there. The cynipid larva is in a little, little um, case here. It's very hard, uh, but you've got a lot of air and then the outside of the gall. And you might wonder, what the heck are they? Why are they so big and why are they, they hollow like that? Well, oaks, oak uh, cynipid gallers have more natural enemies, more parasitoids, other wasps like this pterimid wasp that lay their eggs in the galler than any other type of insect. Uh, so they have to protect themselves from this, this uh, very serious threat from all of these parasitoids. That's a female with a very long ovipositor. And the space between the galler itself and the outside of the gall has to be bigger than that ovipositor. Otherwise, she can reach it and parasitize it. So when this gall is expanding very quickly, she can reach it, but uh, after that, it's big enough and, and the parasitoids can't get to it. So this is the oak chalcid gall that you have here in California, Torimus californicus, and look how long that ovipositor is, and it probably explains why the galls on uh, Quercus gariana, the Oregon oak, or the, the uh, Oregon white oak, it's formed by this uh, cynipid, Andricus quercus californicus, great name. It's the biggest gall that, that we have, and it's got to be big enough so that the, that pterimid can't get its, its uh, ovipositor into those, those baby gallers. Uh, there is tremendous uh, variety in, in uh, uh, galls. Many of them look like plant diseases. People think they're plant diseases. There are 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies. Most of them are cynipids, and most of them are on, on oaks. Um, some of them are on, are on the stems, others are on uh, the leaf itself, and you know, some are hairy and some are not. And this really looks like a, a disease, but it's actually a series of, of galls. Um, some look like that. Some look like pottery. Uh, there's another one on the leaf. Some look like brains. This is an interesting one on, on an oak leaf. Each one of those holes is an exit hole from a single uh, cynipid. So j these four galls on this leaf produced, uh, I don't know, count them up, more than 100 uh, uh, cynipid galls, gallers. There's an interesting uh, contribution of galls to our written history, human written history. A uh, long time ago, thousands of years ago, we found out if you grind up galls 
this particular type of, of gall, and by the way, that's the exit hole where the galler has come out of. And combine it with a few, few chemicals, it makes an indelible black ink. And all of our recorded history, until we came up with better uh, um, options, was written with gall ink. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. The scribes and, and uh, monks in the Middle Ages, all of our recorded history came from gall ink. So there's a, a little um, factoid that you can forget. <laughs> Once those mar marcescent leaves fall, uh, you can now check your, your oak and see whether you've got any polyphemus moth cocoons uh, on it. Now, you have polyphemus moth out here as well. Um, that's what the cocoon looks like when it's hard, they're hard to find when the marcescent leaves are covering them up. But they're easy to see once those leaves drop in, in April. They're silvery, they're large. It comes from uh, a sausage shaped uh, caterpillar, giant silk moth. That's what the caterpillar looks like, and that's what the adult looks like. <clears throat> and if you find one, it's a good thing because like most of our, our giant silk moths, like most of our insects in general, they are in steep decline. And one of the reasons they're in steep decline is because we don't turn our lights off at night. Turn your lights off at night, maybe you can find a polyphemus moth on your oak. Okay, in May, it's when the biological year really, really gets going because the oaks, the leaves have, have uh, fully expanded. They go through their full expansion during, during May. And close on the expansion, uh, the heels of the expansion of those leaves comes the things that eat those leaves. And we're talking about caterpillars. And close on the, the arrival of those caterpillars comes the migrating birds. It is not an accident that our migrating birds are following the populations of caterpillars that are eating our deciduous trees. And if you're a birder, do we have any birders here? At least in the east, birders know if you're gonna see warblers, you gotta to go to oaks because that's where they're, they're going to be. Uh, and I actually had a, a student uh, several years ago, Christy Beal, who quantified this. She looked at the number of minutes warblers were foraging on different families of trees. This is the Phagaceae, that's where the oaks are. Oaks, beeches, and, and chestnuts uh, in cemeteries. These are big old trees in, in cemeteries. Well, the only, the only phagaceae in her, her study were oaks. There were no beeches and there were no chestnuts. So that's uh, obviously where the birds are going. The next one here is pine, so they're a little bit there, but then they, they trail off. I mean, if you're a foraging bird, um, birds don't know where the food is. They have to go, go look around. So they go in, look around, uh, and if there's no food there, they don't return. If you went to, to ShopRite and there was nothing on the shelves, you wouldn't go back again. It's, it's called optimal foraging. We don't want to waste our time looking for food where there isn't any. So what, what's the food? The food is, is caterpillars. Um, caterpillars drive the food web for most of our birds and many other things. Uh, things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the, the, um, the senior moment caterpillar, white blotch heterocampa, <laughs> the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the Hickory tussock moth, the red line panapoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug. They're called slugs because their head is tucked underneath, not because they're really slugs. The purple, uh, the, the pink striped uh, oak worm, the streaked dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar. And hundreds more species are on oaks, and the birds know that. If this were nine in the morning, I wouldn't have goofed that up. <laughs> That's what our house looks like today. Um, actually, the leaves are starting to fall, but we put a lot of, a lot of plants back. So I've got, I'm traditional, I've got lawn there, but about four years ago, I decided to take a picture of every species of, of moth that I found that is making a living in, in our yard. Uh, I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,140 species of, of moths on our property because we put the plants back. Almost 30% of them are on oaks. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. 
Remember what a keystone is. That's the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of the arch. If you take the, the keystone out, the arch falls down. Well, I'm calling these keystone plants because they're producing most of the food. If you take them out of your food web, the food web collapses. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives us food webs. Why do I say caterpillars drive food webs? Because they're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. That's what I mean by that. 14% of our native plants are producing 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. So think of the, of the keystone plants in your yard as the two by fours in the, the ecological house that you're building. They're holding it up. Uh, they're essential. Your, your ecological house is gonna fall down without those keystone plants. In the past, when we thought plants were just decorations, we've been trying to build our houses out of wallpaper and that doesn't work. So you're, you're not finished building your house after you put your keystone plants in, but they're an essential part of it. Um, point is, oaks are the best keystone plant in the country. In 84% of the counties in which they occur, they are the number one keystone plant. In California, they're supporting 271 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. Why do we need all these caterpillars? Again, I'll use birds, but remember a lot of things are out there eating caterpillars that I don't talk about. Um, birds rear their young on caterpillars. 96% of our terrestrial birds are eating insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. A chickadee, for example, takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch. They get one clutch of birds to the point where they leave the nest and that depends on the number of, of birds in the nest. And after they leave the nest, they continue to feed them the baby's caterpillars another 21 days. And after they stop feeding them, the, ba the babies feed themselves, they become independent, they're still eating caterpillars. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. So if you want lots of different types of birds in your yard, you need lots of types of caterpillars. And the oaks, oaks are the best way to get those. Okay, June. June is, is uh, cicada month. At least it was cicada month this year. Now, California has 60, 65 species of annual cicadas that come out every year. What you don't have is periodical cicadas, but we do. Uh, we had the 17-year brood uh, emerge at, at my house this year. There's also a 13-year brood, uh, and it's, it's an exciting time. Now, the media made a big deal out of this. Uh, they call it, it's a terrible scourge, uh, and we should all be, just, just as, as we are for all parts of nature, we should be fear, fearful of it. Uh, it's an invasion. They're going to sing so loud that it's going to drive us crazy, crazy and we'll kill our babies. <laughs> Every, everything you heard about the, the cicada emergence was, was a terrible thing, but none of that was true. It's really one of the most fantastic biological events that, that you're ever going to be, be privileged to witness. I get to see it this year. The next one that comes out at my house, I'll be 87, so... I enjoyed it this year. It was big, a lot of them came out. That's, that's what, one of the trees in front of my building at, at the, the university. They, when they emerge, they leave holes in the ground that aerates the soil, very good. You don't have to pay anybody to do that. And they, they were there in numbers. They were there in such numbers that 11 Mississippi kites flew up from who knows where and spent two weeks in, in Newark, Delaware, eating our, our cicadas. And so there were more people looking at the Mississippi kites than, than anything else. We don't usually get Mississippi kites. So quickly, here's the, the life history. They'll crawl out at night. Uh, that's the last instar, and they're gonna shed their exuvii. They hang down like this, they swing up, grab onto it, and then they, this is like a soft shell crab. So they're totally vulnerable here. They've gotta harden off their, their uh, exoskeleton. And when they do, they're orange and black. And that separates them from the annual cicadas, which are mostly green and, and black. And once they're hard, they, they sing off, um, they fly off. The male will sing, uh, trying to attract a female. Uh, and here he has, he has succeeded. Um, he sings by, uh, I'm not gonna tell you, we don't have enough time for that, but he makes a zzzz, And after a while, it does drive you crazy, but but the female likes it, and she's going to the loudest male. Why the loudest male? Because uh, that's, that's a signal for good genes. The loudest male probably is the biggest male, uh, and that's what she wants. She wants the best genes for her, for her offspring. So she's mating here, but now she's got to lay eggs. That's her ovipositor, and she jams that into twigs. This is a pin oak uh, twig. If you think that's easy, get a pin and try to stick it into an oak branch and see, see how it does. You're gonna bend the, tri the pin before that happens. But she gets it all the way in there, and then she lays an egg, 
and then she moves down, she lays a sequence of, of eggs like that, and then she'll go off and do it someplace else. Well, from the point where she lays these eggs out to the terminal, the branch dies. This is called flagging, and it upsets a lot of people. Oh, they're gonna kill our trees. That tree's not dead, it's just nature's pruning, and it happens once every 17 years. They can, they can deal with it. The little guys hatch, they fall to the ground, tunneling underneath the ground, and then they, they start to feed on, on plant roots. Nobody's been able to measure an impact of cicada feeling. You think even though they can have, I don't know, 25,000, they can have a lot of nymphs on, on plant roots, tree roots, without any depression in, in uh, growth. Um, because they're eating xylem, which is essentially water, plant water. It's not, that's why it takes them 17 years to mature. I had a student this year look at which trees had the most flagging on it, and uh, these first three are, are oaks. That's a pin oak over here. This is just in Newark, Delaware, quick little study, uh, which shows there is some preference for, for oaks. And after they finish ovipositing, they die, and that's, that's the end of that. Why do they spend 17 years underground? Well, again, the favorite hypothesis is predator satiation. A lot of things, a lot of birds. There was an interesting study um, in DC this year. People looking at a good database for, for caterpillar abundance, the cicadas came out um, and the birds all switched from eating caterpillars to eating cicadas. So the caterpillar abundance went up, then the cicadas died, the caterpillar abundance went, went down again. So the birds really did tune in on, on the cicadas and the mammals did too. So when you produce um, a lot of cicadas and you don't have that many cicada eaters around, it's predator satiation and you get to succeed. Okay, July. July is, is when the night chorus begins. Now again, this is mostly an Eastern phenomenon. Uh, I'm talking about katydids. I did a lot of camping when I was, was young and the katydids would sing me to sleep at, at night. It was a very soothing, uh, fond memories of my, my camping. You have one uh, uh, katydid, the angular wing katydid, which uh, is a little bit like the ones we have in, in the East. Um, but this is actually a, a true story here about why Katie Dids are called Katie Dids. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie, and she fell in love with a, a handsome young man. Alas, he did not, he did not share her feelings, and she, she, he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night. And each summer, they solved the mystery by singing, Katie Did, Katie Did. <laughs> So that's why Katie did sing. Um, the male, again, it's the male singing. They lift up their, their wings. There's a scraper and a file, very sclerotized sections of those wings, and they rub them back and forth uh, against each other. Uh, there are four species of Katie dids that are common in eastern oak, oak forest, and, and they really are an important part of the, the oak ecosystem. This is a female. She's a fifth inch star. She hasn't reached maturity yet, but her ovipositor is ready to go. There she is with her wings fully developed, and she's going to lay her eggs, glue them against a, a, a twig. They're big flat things, so if you ever see those, people always wonder what they are. Those are Katie did eggs. These have already hatched, uh, but they stay glued there for a long time. Okay, August is uh, a time, from the time oak leaves first emerge and expand, they start to get harder and harder. Every single day they're a little tougher to eat. And t leaf toughness is a defense against chewing insects. And August is the time when they are the, the toughest. They're filled with tannins, they're filled with lignans, and they are very difficult to eat. Uh, but there's still caterpillars around in August that are eating those leaves. How do they do it? They do it in a couple of different ways. The most common way is through gregarious feeding. This is the yellow neck caterpillar, uh, an early instar, and apparently a lot of mouths are able to get through the tough leaves uh, easier than, than single mouths. That's the same species in fifth instar, um, but they all eat together. And when they do this, they can actually strip the, the leaves off a single branch. Uh, this is the uh, orange humped oakworm, the pink striped oakworm. So gregarious feeding is, is very common in, in oaks. But again, they can, be, they can be numerous. So here's our, our tree here in 2014. I walked around the bottom branches here and there were 115 yellow neck caterpillars just on these lower branches. The point is, can you see any of them? Can you see the damage? No. But if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 115 yellow neck caterpillars stripping your oak leaves, most people get the spray can, call the man, save the tree. They're gonna kill my tree. 
they're not going to kill your tree. Your tree is adapted to that. Your tree is sharing some of its energy so that you have moths, so that you have birds, you have life in your yard because the tree was willing to pass on that energy. And that's the problem with non-native plants. They don't pass on their energy. You don't have any caterpillars, so you don't have any birds, and that's why we plant oaks. Oh, there was a woman, I met a woman in, in uh, New Orleans several years ago, Tammany Baumgarten, who suggested that we all practice the 10-step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all your insect problems disappear. <laughs> That's how you control the insects on your tree. Okay, another, another option is to become a leaf miner. So the toughness is in the, the cuticle, the lower and upper epidermis, but the, the uh, mes palisade mesophyll, the parenchymal cell tissues in the middle of the leaf are still very, very tender. Uh, and that's where the nutrition is anyway. So if you shrink yourself, you can just mine those two layers of, of uh, leaf uh, and become a leaf miner. And then, then you can be very successful. This is a serpentine leaf mine. The egg was laid here and it's called serpentine because it looks like a snake. The, the black streak in the middle there is, is the poops from that caterpillar. It's called frass. And then it pupated here and then fell out of the tree. This is a blotch leaf, leaf mine, another type of leaf mine. There's the leaf miner in there making the, uh, the blotch leaf mine. Um, and that's, that's what a leaf miner looks like. It doesn't look much like a caterpillar um, because it's so specialized for, for, for mining. But when they come out as, as uh, adults, they do look like moths. They're tiny, but they look like moths. So things like the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, um, these are all types of leaf miners. And then many others that can capitalize on oaks in August, even though the leaves are tough because they've discovered leaf mining. August is also a really dangerous time to be a caterpillar because the enemies of caterpillars, the things that eat them, have become uh, as numerous as you're going to get that year. This is a, a, a potter wasp, a eumenid potter, potter wasp who has uh, just uh, stung this uh, uh, yellow striped oak worm. So this, this guy is alive, but he's stiff as a board now. And this, this wasp is going to carry him off and stuff him in her, her little mud, mud nest and then lay an egg on it. And then the egg's gonna hatch and eat him alive. And you might say, well, that's really cruel, but it's really just their form of refrigeration. If she killed this guy and then laid an egg on it, it would rot before the egg even hatched. So this way, it's, paras it's, yeah, it's, it's paralyzed, but it's still very fresh and, and good to eat even uh, many days later. This is that yellow, yellow neck caterpillar uh, egg mass. And minutes after the female has laid the eggs, a little parasitoid shows up and is going to start to lay eggs in those, those eggs. This is probably a, a little, uh, um, it's a little egg parasitoid. <laughs> <laughs> and it laid lots of, lots of uh, inserted probably, it laid lots of, of eggs. Here they are emerging later on. It hit more than 50% of those, those eggs. Uh, and so this is the natural enemy control that keeps the number of caterpillars down on your trees, as long as you allow these natural enemies to be in your yard. If you had sprayed those, those uh, caterpillars, you'd kill the natural enemies first, and then they have a chance to explode. Another really common form of, of natural enemy is a, a tachinid a fly. There are thousands of species of tachinids. They are parasitoids. They lay their eggs on lots of insects, but particularly caterpillars. That's a tachinid egg right there on a saddleback caterpillar. It's going to hatch and tunnel into this, this guy. This is a, the breathing tube of another tachinid larva that's already inside him. It's quite big right now, is eating his insides. And here's a teramelid wasp that's laying eggs in this caterpillar at the same time. So he's dead three times over. This is a contracted uh, daytana that has four uh, tachinid eggs on it. Those three haven't hatched yet. That one has hatched. They're going to tunnel in and kill that, that caterpillar. The black blotch caesura has figured out about uh, tachinid eggs. So it has three permanent white markings on its rear end that look like tachinid eggs. And the, the fly comes and says, well, you're already parasitized. I'll leave you alone. So... Another common way to avoid natural enemies is to fall off the leaf when they come and just hang by a, a silken thread there. You can't see the thread, but it's there. Uh, and if you go out at night and, and shine a light under your oaks, you'll see caterpillars hanging down um, most of the night. They're escaping things that have tried to, to eat them. Uh, but some, some braconid wasps have gotten uh, smart about that as well. They actually will lean over and pull up the silken thread 
and then, then lay an egg in it when they get to the top, or they shinny down the silken thread and lay an egg in it. So tough time to be a caterpillar in August. Okay, September, our last month. Um, this is when cricket populations are at their peaks. And we all know about the black crickets on the ground, a number of species singing. And if they come in your house and they sing, that's, that's good luck. But there are, uh, there are bush and tree cricket, cricket, bush and tree crickets as well that are either uh, green or yellow. Uh, and some of them are up on, on oaks. But these are males uh, and they, they're doing the same thing. They wanna sing loudly so that they can attract females. Uh, but they're, they're smart about it. They will walk along till they find a hole in a leaf, uh, or some species actually chew a hole of the appropriate size. Then they stick their head through the hole and they lift up their wings and then they sing, move those wings back and forth. Most leaves are, are uh, parabola shaped, so they're actually projecting the sound out farther and louder than if he sang on a flat surface. You know, kind of like the guys on the football field, they can, they can pick up the sound. Um, so so he's, uh, he's sending a false message. I am bigger than I really am. Uh, but it fools the female, and she comes and, and she mates with him. But, you know, he may not be bigger than the other guy, but he's probably smarter than the other guy, and that's, that's a good thing. August is also a good time to see uh, walking sticks. Uh, they, they're orthopterans in the uh, group called phasmids. They're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. This is on an emery oak in, in uh, Arizona, uh, but they, they do come down uh, in, in the latter part of the year. Most common time for us to see them in the east is, is uh, September, or even, even in October. Um, there are records of them being so numerous in West Virginia that they actually have caused defoliation a few times. I've never seen that. They're, that's usually you see one or two a year, so it's kind of a special event. All right, we've gone through the year. Um, now we're going to talk about what, what you already know, and that is we've got a biodiversity crisis on planet, planet Earth. Um, you know, you hear that things are disappearing. The birds, are, we've lost three billion birds. They've disappeared in the last 50 years. We've got global insect decline. They're disappearing. They're not disappearing. We're killing them. You know, there's no mystery about why they're not here anymore. We're killing the life that supports us, and that's why we're now in the sixth great extinction that's ever occurred on, on planet Earth. So it is a crisis, it's a global crisis, but I think it's got a grassroots solution that can involve every single person on, on the planet. There are four things that have to happen on every single landscape today, I think, and that you know, no, no, nobody gets a, a pass here. Every landscape has to do this. Every landscape has to be involved in carbon capture. You realize we have, we have uh, removed 3.4 billion acres of forest on planet Earth in the last 300 years. If we put it back, more than a third of the carbon that's up in the atmosphere right now would be, would be pulled out. It's not going to solve the, the climate crisis, but it sure is going to help. So carbon capture on every landscape. Every landscape has to manage the watershed it's in. Nobody has the ethical right to destroy their, their local watershed. And most people don't set out to do that, but the way you landscape is either going to enhance or hurt your watershed. It's got to support a diverse community of pollinators. Why? Not because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's really about a twelfth of our crops. And people say, oh, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need pollinators. You need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere, including our yards. And they also have to support that complex food web that supports all the animals, that, that runs the ecosystems, that support the ecosystem services that, that support us. When you plant an oak, you are addressing three of those four goals. Not just addressing it, you're choosing the best plant for it. Oaks are capturing more carbon, they're managing the watershed uh, better than other plants, they're supporting a more complex food web. The only thing oaks don't do better than other plants is support that diverse community of pollinators because they're wind pollinated. But three out of four is pretty good. Well, despite all those, those landscaping uh, attributes, oaks are in, in trouble. The old giants, you know, our, our forests used to be filled with giant oak trees that, that provided things that young oaks don't, don't provide. The percentage of oaks in our eastern forests has been cut in half in the last century because we've suppressed fire uh, that uh, encourages oaks. And we've also introduced a, a lot of, of serious 
pests. We've, we've got uh, gypsy moth and other things that are eating and killing our oaks, but we've got all these diseases, sudden oak death syndrome, oak leaf or bacterial leaf scorch, oak wilt that's taking heavy toll on our oaks around the country. These are diseases we have brought in. Habitat fragmentation has hindered oak pollination in a lot of places. If you have a single oak here and there, that pollen can't reach it and it's never going to produce acorns. And because of all those things, 28 of the 91 North American oak species are now threatened. One third of the global oaks are endangered. Many of these oaks have very small distributions. So when there's a stress on that distribution, uh, they actually become endangered. The Oregon white oak, for example, that's the oak you have up and down California in Oregon up to Washington, has lost 97% of its range because it grew where we like to grow crops, pecans, and other things. There are 2,300 species that rely on, on oaks in Great Britain that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. And you know, they're rebuilding the, the roof of Notre Dame Cathedral from French oaks. They're using 6,000 large oak trees to do that, which probably is the last of the big oaks in, in, in France. So we humans live out our, our life in a very brief instant of, of ecological time, and we can't return those ancient oaks to, to our landscape during that period but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today will be large enough to assume many or all of their keystone uh, jobs in, in our yards. Every person on the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because every person on the planet requires healthy ecosystems. And the best way to exercise your responsibility towards earth stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our emeralds, our prominence, our gallers, our weevils, our orthopterans, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much.